Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Vanessa Conlin, uh, Master of Wine. I'm the Head of Wine at Wine Access. It's been uh, a couple months since we've had a, a panel discussion like this, a webinar on topics that I think are of interest to anyone who's even just a little bit interested in wine to somewhat obsessed with wine. I think we have uh, quite a wide variety of people that will be joining us today in that regard. So I'm delighted to see the response to have all of you tuning in from home. This is an absolutely amazing panel that I will uh, introduce in just a moment um, and quite an important topic, I believe. So, you know, wine is really, it's something that's so very human. It's something that connects us to the earth. It's something that should bring us all together. And what I hope to accomplish today through this discussion is to remind us exactly what wine is and what it isn't and to eliminate some of the myths that may confuse uh, consumers and the trade alike and to bring us sort of back to basics and have a common language and groundwork for, for what wine actually is. So again, anyone who's just joined us, welcome. Uh, my name is Vanessa. I will be moderating this panel. I encourage you to post questions in the Q&A. As time allows, if time allows, uh, we will answer as many as we can in the Q&A. You're also welcome to interact with each other in the chat uh, and post some questions there as well. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that this seminar is being presented by Decanter, Europe's top selling wine magazine and host of the world's largest wine competition. And speaking of Decanter, I'm thrilled to announce that Wine Access and Decanter have launched their first ever wine club as of today. You can learn more about this and sign up by visiting wineaccess.com forward slash decanter. Now, I'm honored to be joined by these five panelists that I count as friends, um, but they also happen to be so very accomplished in their individual fields that I could literally spend the whole session reading their full bios. So forgive me for shortening their bios just a bit and I'll introduce them now. Uh, Jasmine Hirsch. Jasmine spent her childhood at Hirsch Vineyards. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 2001, Jasmine spent five years working in Europe, followed by two years in New York at JP Morgan. She escaped from corporate life to take over sales and marketing at Hirsch in 2008, and is currently the winemaker and general manager of Hirsch Vineyards. Welcome, Jasmine. Brandon Sparks Gillis. Uh, Brandon is founder, co-owner, and co-winemaker of Dragon Net Cellars in Santa Inez Valley of Santa Barbara, California. Brandon has a degree in geology and worked as an artisan baker before entering the world of wine. He is also currently a stage two candidate for the Master of Wine. So welcome, Brandon. Uh, Dan Petrosky, prior to wine, Dan had a successful career in publishing, including a tenure at Time Magazine. However, a Harvest inter internship in Italy changed his life forever. Dan is the former winemaker for Lark Mead Vineyards and is the founder and winemaker of Massacan Wines. He was the 2017 San Francisco Chronicle Winemaker of the Year. Welcome, Dan. Carlo Mondavi. Carlo Mondavi is co-founder of Rain Winery and co-founder and wine grower of Soria della Sorba in Piedmont, Italy, and a partner at his family's Continuum Estate in Napa. He also founded the Monarch Challenge in 2016, an effort focused on elevating farming by eliminating herbicides and powerful chemicals from farms in Sonoma, Napa, and beyond, and is the co-founder and chief farming officer of the Monarch Tractor, an autonomous electric tractor, the solution to the Monarch Challenge. Last, but definitely not least, Vincent Morrow. Vincent is a master sommelier who has worked at Ridge Vineyards and also at illustrious restaurants such as Gary Danko, Bennu, the French Laundry, and is currently the wine director at Press Restaurant in the Napa Valley. Vincent is also the chairperson of the Diversity Committee of the Court of Master Sommeliers, where he is intent on making the organization more inclusive of women, LGBTQ+, BIPOC, and underrepresented communities within the wine and hospitality industry. Welcome panelists, and let's get started. All right, jumping right in. So um, my Instagram, feed consists of food, cats, and wine. And more and more, I feel I'm being targeted as a wine lover, as I'm sure many wine lovers are, with a lot of ads that seem to suggest that there is a ton of sugar in most wines and that many wines are not quote unquote clean. So let's dive into this, Dan, starting with you. Um, how much sugar is in most bottles of wine and what is zero sugar wine? 
Uh, thank you, Vanessa, Wine Access to Cantor, for having us all here. And it's good to see my friends and have this conversation with you all. But um, to answer your question, it's loaded, right? I mean, I think right now we have seen a, a massive push towards this idea of marketing this thing called clean wines. And it was kind of mysterious about what it actually is, but most wines are, are naturally healthy. Um, I'm not using the word natural um, uh, other than as an adjective here, but most wines are naturally healthy and they contain low sugar, low additives. Um, they are farmed uh, in sustainable ways throughout the world. Um, but clean wines was just a, a potential for a marketing campaign. It was not like we we're doing anything different with making wines here in Napa Valley or Sonoma County or anywhere in the world. They were just actually talking about it in a way that we haven't talked about it in the past. You know, they lowered the potential alcohol a little bit, which therefore lowered the, the, the health risk. It's also lowered the calories in the wine. They kept the sugar out of it, which adds carbohydrates. And with regards to sugar, to put it in reference, I guess a can of Pepsi or a can of Coke or any soda that you drink has anywhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10% sugar. And a, a bottle of wine probably has less than 1% uh, sugar. And that's, in, that's even at a level that, uh, that would be considered very sweet by anyone on this panel. You know, uh, science will tell you that under three grams residual sugar, which is a third of a percent, the human palate can't taste the sugar. I, I had a, um, a philosophy with my winemaking that I was always under one gram residual sugar, but some of my French cohorts in Napa Valley would be like, oh, three grams is just, it's, it's dry, there's no sugar. So things like that, it's like we, we all on this panel and then all the, a lot of the wines you drink, the wine, a lot of the wines, the Cantor Reviews and Wine Access Sells, they're healthy wines. You know, alcohol is the, is the bad part of it. Um, I can go into this a lot long, a lot deeper, but the reality of it is clean wines is really a marketing campaign talking about the things that are naturally in wines with regards to the, like the, that, that aren't, that aren't added to wine, but naturally in the wine. So um, they did a good job. And I think we should actually get on the bandwagon and talk more about the, the fact that our wines don't have additives. Our wines don't have pesticides, herbicides. Our wines are made from organic grapes. Our wines are healthy, except for the alcohol content. They don't have any carbohydrates. They don't have any sodium. Like these are the things that are, are in all wines. But we're just not talking about them and other groups of people are and they're marketing to you and spamming you on social media and um, they're doing a better job at it than we are but uh, they're not doing much different than the winemaking practices that we uh, we all practice here a lot of us practice here in california so so speaking you mentioned i think we brought up additive so i i do think there's also a lot of questions about what a fining agent is and what that actually adds or doesn't add to a wine is that something is that something again that you want to continue talking about or someone on the panel would like to would like to chime in on uh, i'm happy to talk about that <laughs> i'm happy you. to add you know pass it pass it on to brandon and carlo and jasmine as well um additives can be anything in the cellar from water to acid to commercial yeast to nutrients, uh, vitamins, amino acids, uh, sulfur. Um, when you're talking about adding something like a, a finding agent, you're actually asking to take things out of the wine. And what I mean by that is like the dead yeast cells after the fermentary process will be floating around in your wine and create a bit of a hazy character, but no one wants to drink truly hazy wine. I think, you know, I always joked around and saying, when you're ready to propose to your significant other, you find the cleanest, clearest, most the clarity of the diamond is the most important thing to you. When I drink a glass of wine, the clarity of the wine is the most important thing to me. So that's why we do things like stand the bottle up for multiple days before we open it, opening it, or we decant it. So finding agents will go in, they'll settle down. It could be egg whites in, uh, in, in Bordeaux varieties, you know, in Asian barrel. It could be fish bladders called Isinglass. It could be clay called bentonite. It could be gelatins. You put them in the wines to kind of to attach to those, those things that are floating around like dead yeast cells to settle them out to the bottom of the wine. And then you take the wine out off the, off of the, the settling, the, off the settling leaves, you rack it to uh, a, the clean wine to another vessel before bottling it. Um, egg whites are egg whites, right? You know, so if you don't drink dairy and someone uses egg whites in your wine, then um, they should tell you about that. Just an observation on, on, uh, Finding as well. Uh, at Rain, we use like very little new oak and we don't fine or filter. And I found that um, a new oak barrel can almost feel like, it, you know, it gives it that oak tannin. Um, it gives it some, some uh, another dimension um, just with the flavonoids and the kind of characters like coming from the vanillin and all that. And it can give it this, this 
bigger presence can also and sometimes accentuate acidity. So I, I look at barrels in a weird way now as like almost a, um, uh, you know, not obviously it's not finding, it's not trying to deal with clarity or any of these, but it, it, there is some element that you get from the oak tannin that um, that feels very much like fining because um, of the result of, at the end of, of the elevage. Um, Got it. Thank you. And actually, Carl, if you don't mind, I'll stick with you while we're on this topic. So then, so what are some of the things that then can be done to sort of influence, other than you mentioned oak, uh, that can influence the flavor of a quality and the quality of a wine that, that it aren't, doesn't involve additives? Yeah, I think, and I think you nailed it right there, is what can we do that can create uh, you know, I, you know, a greater, broader, deeper wine um, without adding anything in the cellar. And it all comes down to farming. Uh, for me, uh, something my grandfather, my father always preached was site is the most important thing in wine and then how you honor that site. And so having an incredibly biodiverse soil microbiome, having a biodiverse farm, um, I think adds a, a, a significant dimension to the wine. And then it's all about, you know, understanding because wine or vineyards will talk to you. And each vine talks to you. We used to talk, we used to talk about the microclimate was a place like Sonoma, and then it was Sonoma Coast. And now we talk about the individual microclimate of a vine. And so being able to understand and, and when you look at a vine, be able to see, okay, this vine has short shoots. We might not want to put out as much crop on this vine this next year, or this vine's, you know, very, very abundant, very healthy. We might not want to do anything, just kind of let it go on its journey. So I think it's it's about being a bit of that vine whisperer and, and understanding the vineyard really well. And then um, when you bring that back to the cellar, uh, it really will make the job in winemaking so much easier and make you, I, I always say that a great site just makes everything in the cellar that much better. Uh, it really makes your, your life easier. Um, but when you, when you have a great site and you honor it at, the high, at a high level, great soils, um, uh, and, and, and great biodiversity above the soils, uh, it lends itself to uh, an incredible, uh, uh, and, and that site, but it lends itself to making wines of incredible expression, depth, and finesse. Um, and so that's something we're focused on. And I know um, the fellow panelists um, are, are as well. I, I always get inspired, like when I drive by Hirsch on my way to our vineyard in Fort Ross Seaview, just with the abundance of life that, that is out there. Uh, it's important. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, just a couple more questions on this topic before we, from, before we move on. So, so Brandon, just, just to go back to this kind of clean wine idea for a minute, wh what are some things then that would make a wine quote unquote unclean? You know, that's a fantastic question because there's no legal definition for clean wine that actually is anyone's uh, bag to try to answer. <laughs> I mean, I think that clean wine, and we'll probably talk a little bit about natural wine in this regard, you know, there are movements that are essentially, particularly with clean wine, Dan nailed it, it's, it's a marketing, dynamic. And so there is, there's no legal definition of what a clean wine is. There's very little legal definition of, you know, what wine is or what wine can or can't be, you know, even within the United States. There are a number of additives that the FDA has approved, over 60 additives. That said, so one would assume that maybe clean wines wouldn't be using those additives, but as Carlo and Dan have already mentioned, the sort of caliber of wines that we're talking about and the kind of farmers that we have on this panel, that sort of winemaking is typically stripped down to a really bare minimum anyway. You know, where you're looking at, if you were forced mm -hmm. to put an ingredient label on, it would literally say grapes or organic grapes, perhaps a little bit of sulfur. Again, maybe some little bit of fining agent. And granted, there are wines that take advantage of that sort of cornucopia of, of additives. But when we look at what those are, so I mean, if, if you're buying wine at a gas station on a trip around the United States, you know, on the, off the bottom shelf, yeah, there's gonna be some things in there. Now that said, uh, they're probably gonna be uh, as benign or less than the can of soda pop or Red Bull or whatever else you're grabbing off the shelf. So, I mean, they're really, you know, there's not a lot of kind of demonic unclean things that really can be added to wine. Um, so I think it's kind, of, it's kind of careful to watch that marketing. And I, I think it, Dan brought up a good point, which is that we within wine culture, I think should take it upon ourselves to educate people that you know, wines mm -hmm. of quality are agricultural products expressive of sight that, you know, when they're made thoughtfully have an incredibly minimal impact in terms of, you know, other ingredients or any, anything that might be put in the body. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually that leads me to a question with Vincent is sort of, sort of understanding this is like, how, as a consumer, Vincent, like how could a consumer in your opinion better distinguish between marketing and authenticity when they're purchasing wines? 
Oh man, that's a uh, <clears throat> that's that's a can of worms. Uh, I think the first clue, and Dan uh, uh, alluded to that, is um, you know most small wineries. Uh, I think probably everyone on this panel can can speak to that. You don't have a marketing person. It's usually uh, you know social media or things that are very low cost and um, and but can provide a bigger input. But uh, the reality is uh, there's not a lot of money to be made in the wine business, especially as a smaller winery. So having a full-time marketing person or having a marketing firm just doesn't exist. So a lot of the marketing and advertising we see surrounding wineries that can afford to do so um, have either been around for a very long time and, and have the uh, ability already to do so, or they're so large, um, in fact, that you know, you'll see a billboard or a commercial, but that's really, um, that's why it's such a rarity. Uh, in the beverage world to see uh, to see wine marketing. Um, the other clue I would say is, uh, and, and again, Dan, uh, Brandon and Carlo alluded to this, but you know, looking out for buzzwords like clean or vegan or gluten-free, wine is inherently all of those things, you know, with, with very few uh, exceptions throughout the winemaking process. So if someone or a brand is uh, advertising that, um, and, and, and putting a lot of weight and emphasis on that, that you know, could potentially be a point of, of skepticism or it could just be they're communicating it very well. But I think there's just, you know, do, you know, do your research, who owns the brand, um, who are they distributed or imported by, uh, if it's not a, a local product, um, you know, who is the winemaker, are they listing an origin of, uh, of grapes or an appellation or a subregion on the label you know, are there are there things that um, objectively and, um, and legally um, actually define uh, what's in the wine, um, or is it, you know, uh, is is it more does it feel more flashy? And uh, you know, it's it's tough because uh, as Brandon said, there's not um, and and I saw a question pop up. There's uh, there's not a legal requirement for a lot of ingredients that can go into wine to actually be listed on the label. But by and large, you know, at the level that everyone on this this panel is operating at, and many many um, small brands in California, there's not a whole lot of input that goes into it that would justify being put on the label beyond uh, water, grapes, and uh, perhaps fining agents, et cetera. So I don't uh, I don't uh, uh, envy uh, consumers these days because there's a lot there's a lot to choose from. There really is. But to Brandon's point, you know, if you're drive, if you're doing your cross country track in the U.S. and you're buying from the bottom shelf in a gas station, who knows? <laughs> and it, and uh, to just briefly uh, address the 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 mega purple or or that question um, uh, in the know, chat, I think yes. that that could that that perhaps my suspicion comes from politics and lobbying and. Yeah, you know, so that those things don't legally have to be put on a label, and that's uh, that's always tough. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, there's been mention of you know farming of site. I saw a question actually in the Q and A pop up about organics. So, Jasmine, if we could if we could move to you. So, uh, loaded question, complicated question, I should say. There's a lot to dive into, but then what really is? What is the difference between organic? biodynamic and sustainable. Okay, yeah, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, so the first thing that we should talk about too is the difference between organic grapes. Like, so let's take organics first, organic grapes and organic wine. So, and you know, we're here in the US, but I'll touch on a little bit the EU rules as well. So um, first, when we talk about organic grapes, um, it's similar to what you would think of, you know, to be USA, USDA certified organic grapes. It's similar to what you would see or exactly the same as what you would see with USDA certified organic foods. Um, when we think about organic farming, right, you know, we're contrasting it with conventional or, you know, industrial or some people call it chemical farming. Um, broadly, organic farming is shunning man-made uh, chemical compounds. That doesn't mean there's no chemicals used at all in the farming, uh, but they have to be naturally sourced. 
And there's a focus on preventing rather than um, curing something like, for example, uh, fungal diseases. So we have we deal with a lot of rot and mildew in viticulture. And so rather than saying, okay, I'll just let that fungus appear and then I'll spray chemicals, instead, an organic farmer might be more focused on good canopy management techniques. Um, there's also a focus on improving the soil, the structure of the soil, um, the biological components of the soil, you know, Carlo touched on that, um, and improving it through compost and or cover cropping as opposed to direct additions of chemical fertilizers. Um, organic wine, as defined by the USDA, has to be first made from organic grapes. Um, and there's a, there are additives that are allowed, um, but the big one that's not allowed in the US to be considered organic wine is sulfur. The EU does allow sulfur added for organic wine, but the US, uh, USDA does not. But I'm rather surprised by the list of additives that are permitted for, for wine to be labeled organic. Um, frankly, the USDA organic certification for food in general I think is pretty loose. I, I think like with anything, you got to know your certifying body. So, you know, if, if you tell me that, you know, this carrot is certified by Oregon till I'm like, hell yeah, that's like a real organic carrot USDA. You know, it's a little, again, you know, politics comes into this, right. Farmers lobby to have the, the rules be, you know, lighter so that they can, you know, fit under these rules. Biodynamics, um, this is the oldest green farming movement. It predates organics by about 20 years. Um, and so take everything that I just said about organic farming, um, start there and then add on a couple other things. So the main differences would be that uh, biodynamic farming follows the rhythms of uh, the planets and the, the other bodies in the solar system, particularly the moon. So we farm biodynamically at Hirsch. We pay great attention to the moon cycles um, when choosing to carry out farming activities. Um, there's a set of preparations that we also use that are um, based on minerals and herbs um, that we also use in biodynamics. And then I would say the last thing that makes a uh, one biodynamic is this focus on the whole farm. So biodynamics is at its very nature all about creating a self-sustaining farm, sustainability in the deepest sense. So there's no such thing as the biodynamic vineyard. It's the biodynamic farm. The vineyard is seen as part of a greater whole. It should include animals. The people are super important. I think you might be shocked by how much people have been removed from the, the farming equation. I mean, they're so essential. Um, so biodynamics is, is, you know, organics plus those things I just mentioned. I will say, you know, a lot of people consider biodynamics to be irrational, unscientific. Um, there's not a lot of science to show that any of this stuff really makes a difference or works, but they have looked at vineyards that are farmed biodynamically and they are shown to have higher microbial life, especially deeper down in the soil than you might expect and better root penetration and growth um, in the vineyard, which is super, super important. Um, and that is compared to conventional and sometimes even compared to organic vineyards, which you know, will also have a higher percentage of organic matter in, in the soil. So, you know, it's, and then in the winemaking, you know, it's, it's similar to organic, but it's stricter in that it doesn't allow certain processes that are allowed um, and additives that are allowed in organics. Um, and then sustainable, you know, I think sustainability is a great starting point. Um, I, you know, I think when we talk about real sustainability, you know, there's the farming, right? And then we can also talk about our carbon footprint, social sustainability, economic sustainability. I think sustainability should be considered in concert with farming practices. I should not be a replacement for organic or biodynamic, but it's a great place to start and it can be really additive so that we're not just thinking about how we take care of the soil and, and, and the farm, but how we take care of our community. What kind of bottle do we use? Like, let's get rid of these heavy bottles. What's our carbon footprint? Um, you know, so how are our wineries powered and designed? Um, and, you know, what are our labor practices? Um, but sustainability should not be a replacement for organic or biodynamic or some sort of green farming. So yeah. I hope that answers that. Yes, very, um, very, please, Dan, yeah. 
I just, I'm so glad you're recording this because I do hope that you can take out everything Jasmine just said and post it somewhere on the internet so that everyone can find it because she totally defined, you know, organics versus biodynamics versus like sustainability. And I'm so happy that she wasn't shitting on sustainability because a lot of people do shit on the word. But the, the word sustainable is like, how do you build a sustainable business over time? And Jasmine encompasses that in her answer. So I please do me a favor, social media people out there, take her video, put it out and let everyone be able to go back to it and click to it whenever they have that question because she nailed it. That was awesome. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you, Dan. 100% agree. Yeah, and Jasmine, you actually led, uh, or provided a perfect segue to a question that I had actually for Carlo because you mentioned carbon footprint. So Carlo, I wanted to ask you, so like, what is the carbon footprint of wine and, and how does it compare to, let's say, other types of farming? Oh my gosh. Oh, well, um, the carbon footprint is is just like, right now we are in a climate, uh, excuse me, a climate crisis um, and a biodiversity crisis. And I think they're really kind of one of the same. And um, when just taking, for example, my family, my family has been farming for just over a uh, hundred years now um, in the state of California. And through the kind of three areas that we've 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 been farming, um, we've seen 120 parts per million of CO2 increase uh, on our planet. And while that might seem like it's not a lot, um, when you zoom out 10,000 years back to the beginning of wine, back to the beginning of human civilization, there was a stable climate that traded about 250 parts per million for you know the last you know 10,000 years up until uh, in the 1890s when we invented a technology which was the coal power plant, and then just shortly thereafter, the fossil fuel vehicle, and then began the fossil fuel era. And, and so you're, when, you, when you look at you know, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, climate change uh, affected wines making really for some you know, more beautiful, I look at the 90s, for example, beautiful vintages. So you, you, you think of 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, and then finally 98 came along and, and there was El Nino and, and, and they said, they have, we have to give a bad vintage because finally there's some rain and it was actually a great yeah. vintage. Um, but climate change and, and this, I, I talk about this also from the context of, of, of my fiance's winery in Piemonte and our little project that we've got there. Um, when, when you think about what's happening, it's very scary because up until then, we didn't realize that that this was impacting us in such a dramatic way. But when you look at just my father's winery with Continuum and and also with with Rain, um, you know, 2015 we lost lost half of our crop to drought. 2017, my father lost 30 percent of his crop to wildfire. Um, 2020, 100 uh, percent of Continuum will not be produced, um, and 60 percent of of Rain was will not be produced, unfortunately. Um, so climate change has finally caught up to us and it's in a very scary place. And the other really scary thing is we know, so we, we always, you, you talk about sustainability and people will oftentimes talk about, well, the glass or the cork or the carbon footprint that once it leaves the winery, but what we need to be thinking about and talking about is what can we do directly at our farm? And, and so when you talk about having a soil that has an incredible microbial life and the ability to help fix uh, greenhouse gases. And when you look at um, protecting biodiversity and not using herbicides or dangerous chemicals that hurt pollinators and butterflies, et cetera, um, it's important on the biodiversity side to focus on that as well as a climate action. And then also mm -hmm. um, to deal with our carbon footprint on farming. So right now we all use tractors to basically farm our our farms to get work done. It used to be, if you go to Burgundy or Champagne or uh, Bordeaux, the vine row spacing is literally to accommodate the horse's belly, right? So it's a meter wide, that's big enough. So now when you, when you think about the world of wine, everything's to accommodate the tractor and turning on one compact tractor, um, you know, like a 40 to 70 horsepower tractor is like turning on 14 cars and it's NOx particulate and CO2. So they're incredibly uh, pollutive, but Thankfully, um, we are at this inflection point where we understand that that all these things are very scary, and now we have the technology to be able to employ green resources. So, through whether it's electric, you know, because you know, an electric vehicle, for example, from cradle to grave is like seventy percent cleaner than than a fossil fuel vehicle. And when you look at tractors, it's even yeah. greater. So, the ability now to take and we talk about farming and how proud we are and how much we love farming and 
there's something really special right now that's happening. And that's the ability for us to farm two crops. Of course, the cover crops and all that, but not just the vineyard, but also energy. Um, we have the land as wineries and farmlands to be able to harness renewable energies in the form of wind, geothermal, hydro, and certainly solar, which is the most abundant that you can find in, in vineyard land, and power our farms this way, right? We can skip the grid and now com completely mm -hmm. get to a place where we're renewably farming. And this is what's exciting. This is kind of self shamelessly ties back to Monarch Tractor, which is a project that I'm involved in, um, which I never imagined myself being involved in a technology business. But when the Monarch Challenge, which was a challenge to get rid of herbicides from Sonoma and Napa and get rid of neonicotinoids and create through communication, because not one farmer wakes up and wants to spray chemicals, not one of them. We are all yeah. in this leaking canoe together trying to get down the river. And so <laughs> when it, it gets very political and the Monarch Challenge is going to fail, unfortunately, because there was an economic divide between clean farming. So when you farm organically or biodynamically, the contact sprays that you, that you use are not as powerful as the synthetic sprays that you use in conventional farming. So oftentimes there's a greater carbon footprint and then also a greater cost to, to employ these farming practices. And so I would go talk to farmers and they would be heartbroken that, that uh, these chemicals were bad and, and say, well, I can't afford to do this. I've got to put food on the table for my family. I've got to get my kids for college, et cetera. And so anyways, um, the exciting thing, um, and I'm sorry, I've gone a long way around, the Monarch Challenge um, was going to fail. The Monarch Tractor is a solution to that. It's all electric, it's driver optional, it's smart, so it bridges the economic divide and the carbon footprint divide and allows for us as farmers now to, and this is just one of the platforms. There's a lot of platforms that are going to be coming out that will allow for us to be able to harness renewable energy to power our farms, to lower the carbon footprint that we're directly in charge of, right, as farmers. Um, the other things in terms of corks and um, bottles and all of that, um, the corks, you know, using natural corks, there's a great slide that Amarim showed recently that desertification stopped just south of the cork forest in Portugal. Um, and, and this is because they've been able to keep this kind of renewable farming practice alive to be able to allow for us to have natural closures. So I think when, when I think about the carbon footprint in, in wine, I think that it's, it's great. I think about the carbon footprint in agriculture, you know, in first world countries, 25% of our carbon footprint is coming from agriculture In third world countries, it's more like 35%. So we have a significant amount of work to do, but I tie it back to two things, protect our biodiversity on our planet, the soil microbiome, the farm biology, and get away from fossil fuel as quickly as we can and bridge into a renewable planet so we can sustain and make wine for <laughs> not just decades, but centuries to come. Uh, we have to. Yeah. Um, I'd so like to add one quick thing on please, that, Vanessa. Please, Brandon. So, yes. <clears throat> Carla, that was really well said. And I think that there really is this full circle thing. And I think that it's important. It's really easy in this day and age to get pretty depressed about the climate crisis, among many other things like that happening in society. But the, the lever, the power of agriculture on a global scale if you start moving that needle from conventional, and again, the other thing to remember is that in an organic system, you're using organic fertilizer, organic compost, as opposed to synthetic fertilizer, and synthetic applications. Those sort of nitrate and nitrogen-based fertilizers are incredibly carbon intensive on the conventional side. So as that spins over towards, even on a spectrum move towards organic, you have massive uh, carbon benefit that way. And I think that wine is uniquely positioned because particularly kind of at the level of this panel and at what decanter and wine access typically looks at, wine is a high value agricultural product. So we're able to actually really do a lot of these things in the farming practices that may be a little bit more costly today. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the balance sheet over a 50 or 100 year span, much more sustainable uh, going forward. And I think that the wine industry has this great opportunity right now to sort of be leaders and show what can be done. And then mm -hmm. row crop farming. I mean, if you look at the Midwest, the United States, I mean, if we actually started to move the needle on what was happening in Indiana and Iowa and corn and soy and start moving that from kind of turbo conventional over towards a more sustainable organic thing, the carbon uh, positive impact would be unbelievably positive. I mean, bigger than electrification of vehicles. I mean, agriculture really has the power to change like the whole planet. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. And that's one of like my personal goals is to make organic farming the new conventional. And conventional, <laughs> it's... We've yeah. been under this since the Green Revolution, just this like malaise of, of following what the you know PhDs from the chemical industry have, have been selling us. 
And, and now finally, and I think Jasmine alluded to this before, there's not been a significant amount of research done into like the soil microbiome. We still understand like 10% of, of the microbial activity in the soil microbiome, which is crazy because, and, and what you were saying is 100% true. If we can preserve and have a healthy and a biodiverse soil, um, we, we can significantly uh, increase our carbon sequestration and help balance. Agriculture is a massive component to uh, battling climate change, as is, uh, we, it's, it's a full court press right now. We are, there's not one area where we can let off the gas right now to try to uh, accelerate towards a renewable, a renewable planet. But um, yeah, well said on that. And, and uh, we have to just anything, what we have to do is, is make all the things that, that put our planet first economically superior to anything that puts our planet second. And so that's, that's, um, that's the key, economics. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Vincent, I wanted I wanted to throw this conversation in your way because as a sommelier, how important is it to you, and how is it important to your customers if a wine is organic, biodynamic, or sustainable? Um, <clears throat> that's great because there's a uh, uh, short answer, uh, incredibly important to me, and you know I get equally depressed and excited about you know where we're headed and. You know, we were uh, we were sidebarring a bit before this started about how it's been 80 degrees for uh, almost two weeks straight in Napa at the beginning of February. And you know, I'm not I'm not a farmer, um, I'm not a winemaker, but I know that's bad. Um, you know, and 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 uh, I think Dan said it's been dry for the past 50 days uh, in California, and this is my first winter in California. I think it rained on and off straight for uh, about five months, and that's that should be normal. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, the writing is on the wall uh, in that regard. In terms of in the restaurant with, uh, with guests asking, it's, it's, it's pretty rare, uh, to be honest. However, when the parameters for their choices or um, what they would like to drink fall into uh, anything that remotely fits, say, say rain uh, or lark mead, two, two of the four wines, um, from Dan and Carlo. Uh, unfortunately, we don't carry Central Coast or uh, many Sonoma Coast wines, uh, Jasmine and Brandon, so I apologize. Um, but love the wines, they're delicious. And when it, uh, when it comes to those wines and recommending them, it's absolutely something uh, that we talk about and use as an important part, um, not of the sale, because I, I hate to call it a sale, but of the conversation surrounding mm -hmm. why this is a wine to keep an eye out for. And even if they don't, necessarily drink it here at the restaurant, it's still putting it on the radar for them to look for it on the market. Got it, thank you. Um, Absolutely. So, so I think uh, Jasmine maybe mentioned this word of sulfur or sulfite. So this is something I feel is, is um, massively misunderstood, demonized um, when talking with consumers uh, about, uh, about this topic. So I'd love to kind of dive into this and see what we can unearth. Um, so Brandon, why don't we start with you? So. What, are sul what is sulfur? What are sulfites? Why is this used in, in winemaking? Well, first of all, I'm glad to talk about this. This is kind of one of my pet project favorite things to talk about because there is, when you talk about wine myths, uh, sulfur in wine is way, way up the totem pole in terms of something that is very visible and there's a ton of misinformation about. So, I mean, to take it back to like the, the truly, the, the true basics, sulfur is a naturally occurring element. Um, it's something that's found, I mean, it, go around any volcanic area and you'll actually smell sulfur fumes coming up, people to find mineable sulfur. So it's a naturally occurring element. And the reason that it's important in wine is that it is historically for a very long period of time now, it's been the go-to in terms of one of the most powerful antioxidants and antimicrobial treatments that can happen to wine. And again, it, it's also, I think it's such a- While Brandon is reconnecting actually Dan I had a question for you about this which is do sulfites give people headaches um that's a, the the age-old question and it's actually being crowdfunded to do some research at UC Davis right now to talk a little bit more about whether sulfites give us headaches I don't want to speak to individual body chemistry because everyone's body reacts differently to different things um, you can look at that simply by relating it to allergies and some people are allergic to certain pollens and others are not and um, some of those things in the winemaking process will make it through 
to uh, the finished wine and it's your body chemistry that's going to, the histamines in your body are gonna react to protect your body and push off headaches and stuffy noses and all those things. Um, and then that's why we take antihistamine drugs. So those allergens, you have to remember wine comes from grapes, which comes from vines, which have leaves that are plant-based. And so there's a, a lot of naturally occurring um, microbes that are part of this process and no one's really spent the time, energy, effort, or money. That's why UC Davis is kind of pursuing this to kind of like finally put the nail in the coffin on the myth whether or not sulfur is the thing that gives us headaches. Um, but uh, it's still, it's still, it's still a fun, mythical conversation to have and to debate. I mean, I, I hope it never dies and never goes away because, you know, like why, I mean, if, if you're not debating and having fun and kind of make, and, and kind of interacting, engaging and have a conversation over wine, then what, what good is it? Yeah. Uh, let's see if Brandon, Brandon, are you, are you back? I hope so. Sorry about that. You are back. Okay, <laughs> great. Cause you are, you are on a roll that I think we were well, all enjoying. So. <laughs> yeah, it just well, just it is it is again the, one of the most kind of at, at very mi like micro dose levels. It's a very powerful antioxidant and antimicrobial. So it's actually a way of preserving wine. And you know, all of us on the panel who are winemakers and Vincent, you know, like look at those beautiful bottles behind you. You know, one of the definitions of great wine is the ability to be able to improve and mature over time. And for that to happen, tiny little amounts of sulfur play a huge role in actually aiding the arc of that aging curve. So again, really, really important things at very, very small levels used to beneficially help wine. And I think it's important to set the standard of where those levels are, because again, back to the headache discussion, headaches, allergies, there's a lot of misnomers about that. I'm asthmatic. I actually am literally allergic to sulfur dioxide. So, I mean, I'm very sensitive to this and I know that. And I think a lot of consumers don't understand that a lot of other products that they're using day to day or giving to their small children have orders of magnitude higher levels of sulfur dioxide than a bottle of wine. So for instance, dried fruit is, I mean, really the thing that kind of sets the scale off. The little box of raisins that a lot of people will put in their kids' school lunches, uh, sulfur is typically measured in parts per million. The legal limit for sulfur in the United States is 350 parts per million. I've rarely ever seen that happen. I think most of the folks in this room would be more in that kind of 50 to 100 range at the absolute max. Uh, raisins, Conventional dried fruits typically go between 500. They start around 500 and go up to 2,000 parts per million. So, I mean, you're looking at you know, dozens of times higher, you know, more sulfur in one of those little box of raisins than is in an entire case of wine. <laughs> so wow. it is a microdose. I think it's important to know that it's just using these little teeny levels. There's sulfur in all sorts of processed foods. Um, so if, if people eat fast food and particularly things that have been frozen like French fries, French fries from a drive-through anywhere uh, in America that's coming out of a freezer, again, they're gonna be three to 10 times higher than what's in wine. And uh, I really don't hear people putting a campaign on French fries as a, a demonic thing, bringing people headaches. <laughs> so, you know, if you have the ability to handle French fries or dried fruit or soda pop or energy drinks, uh, even jam, uh, most, a lot of preserves that you buy in the supermarket would again have just significantly higher level of sulfites. So I think it's important to put it in context and just to, to, to remember that it, though, though we have to put that in the label just as a legal requirement, the amount that's used is typically a really, really tiny amount and not something that would typically trigger allergies in all but like the most sensitive 0.01% of the population. Got it, thank you. Um, so that leads sort of um, into an, another topic which is natural wine. So Vincent, I was hoping to, to start with you here. So what is a natural wine? Uh, natural wine as, uh, as with um, good wine and clean wine is a, is a can of worms uh, that carries, can carry a lot of connotations depending on, on the person, but I'll try to be as um, sort of objective uh, with it as possible. Um, I mean, wine is inherently natural. And, and the messaging, as Dan said, around it is, is really, really confusing. And it's something that the wine industry has to strive to be better at as a whole, um, even though we're made up of hundreds of thousands of you know, smaller producers, somehow we have to, to band together and communicate it better. Um, I think the, the general application or some objective things that uh, everyone has already touched on with regenerative farming, with biodynamics or uh, being sustainable or organic, there's, you, in, in my eyes, I'm thinking or, or assuming to kind of qualify that, you know, there's no pesticides used, 
uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the vineyard production that in the winemaking process there's you know minimal to no additives that the fermentation is carried out uh, with ambient yeast um, it's bottled unfined unfiltered um, certainly all of these things don't have to in order to qualify because there's no legal definition surrounding it and it's uh, it's a bit of a paradox because if you if if we were to try to build a legal definition around it, that almost goes against the um, the tenets of natural winemaking and the freedom to to do as you please. So it's a it's it's a bit of a a tricky a tricky place to be. And not uh, what I what I would want to convey to everyone that um, natural wine wine is inherently natural and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or bad. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's a focus or it's a, it's a style. And uh, some could even say, uh, and in some circles, it could be a cult, but uh, that's, yeah, it, it, it's very loosely defined and it's confusing. And um, I, I would say just approach as you would with anything else. Uh, uh, if someone tells you a wine is natural, you know, decide if you like it or not and don't let that term or definition surrounding it be the ultimate determinant. Yeah. And so Jasmine, I think for you, because you gave us such a beautiful sort of dissertation on organics, biodynamic sustainability, then how does natural wine fit or not fit with any of within any of those other categories? Well, I think, you know, as Vincent noted, it the natural wine movement has, you know, be, has there's an aspect of it that is very much about marketing and has been kind of co-opted also for marketing. Um, but I think that the natural wine movement has also been a, you know, I would say a healthy reaction to an over-industrialization of wine and an over-industrialization of, you know, agriculture in general. Um, but it does tend to create this um, imaginary binary universe where there's natural and non-natural wine, same thing like clean and unclean. Wine is on a spectrum, you know, the, the, the choices that winemakers make, you know, the other thing too, I'll just back up and say, I think Ted Lemon of Literai put it perfectly, which is that natural wine is a spoiled berry in the forest. There is no natural wine. All wine is made. You have to plant the vineyard, you know, it's agriculture, right? You got to plant the vineyard, you got to choose to pick the grapes, you got to put them in a vessel. And then yes, you know, how many choices, how many interventions you could say, do you make after that? Um, and what do you consider to be an acceptable intervention to achieve your goals? I would say also that, you know, a lot of this conversation and a lot of these topics point towards our values. If you are focused on having, you know, food or products that you put in your body that have no additives whatsoever, you know, coming back to that carrot, right? That there's no additives whatsoever. Um, you know, that might be the focus in how you pick your wines. If your concern is the environment, then you might be more concerned about how that winery cares for the land versus whether or not they add sulfur to their wines or add anything else to their wines. Um, or, you know, what's the carbon footprint of the winery? You know, so I think, I think, we should avoid the binary and instead, instead get to know our producers, understand the choices they make along that continuum of choices that winemakers do have and farmers do have, and take the values that you have around how you want to live your life, your social values, your environmental values, and apply that to your wine purchasing and ask those questions of producers to find out which wines reflect your values. I think there's a lot of really positive values that are emphasized in the natural wine movement, but they are, they also exist in lots of other. There's also problems in the natural wine movement, just like there is in the rest of the, the wine industry as well. So um, it's not binary would be sort of my, my answer. Got it. And so Dan, let's, to wrap up this, um, this topic with you. So, you know, making a, a wine that is more natural what is the difference for you and is it more difficult or not difficult to make a wine in that way? I don't think it's more difficult to make a wine that way. It goes back to the original conversations and uh, subject matter that uh, Carlo and Jasmine were talking about with the healthy ecosystem of growing grapes. And once you start to, to grow your grapes in a healthy environment, 
and you see you have a more strong and more robust uh, chemical makeup of your of your must, your grape must, which are the grapes that come off the vine during harvest, it becomes a little easier. Less additives are needed, less nutrients are needed, less sulfur, no less antioxidants are needed when you have a healthy ecosystem. Um, and that is uh, that I think is the most important thing. I mean, just a quick six year study, 2015, Larkmead started uh, organically farming. 2016, I eliminated the additive of water. 2017, I eliminated the additive of acid. 2018, I eliminated the additive, additive of nitrogen. 2020, we eliminated commercial yeast. 2021, you could potentially produce natural made wines in a healthy Napa Valley style because it started in the vineyard as creating a healthy ecosystem. And I think once you, and then it's also the confidence that a winemaker has to do nothing, not to overreact or react too quickly to uh, a, a dilemma in the cellar or, or, or a faction in the cellar where you're like, oh, I need to do something to continue this process moving forward. And um, okay. so it's not that hard to make it. It takes a lot of um, uh, passion and, and confidence, but it also it's the confidence that you do that uh, before the grapes are even brought into the cellar. Um, that'll help you get to make a quote unquote natural, natural wine. But um, the one only thing, Vincent, the only place I saw like kind of a sign of like what the actual rules are is if you were to join the raw fair, which is um, the greatest, uh, you know, kind of natural wine fair in the world. And they tell you there's like 10 things you need, your wine needs to check certain boxes. And, um, and then include, like you can still use sulfur and be a natural wine. It's up to 70 parts uh, total sulfur. So um but no additive, organic grapes, no commercial yeast, no additives, uh, no fining, no filtration. Um, and then up to 70 parts free total sulfur. You could be quote unquote, a natural wine, according to the raw fare. Yeah. And uh, before we move on and not to put you on the spot, Carlo, but I saw you nodding your head a lot to what, to what Dan was saying. Was there anything you wanted to add? No, I think, I, I mean, I think Dan nailed it. Um, if, if you have a beautiful site, which we're all blessed to have in, in the wine business, um, and you honor at a high level, and you you have a you know healthy biodiverse soil and 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 um, you know cover crop and kind of flora um, and fauna, then and and then you make a good pick decision. I think the pick decision is critical, right? When the sugars, tannins, and acids are imbalanced, you don't have to add acid or you don't have to add yeast because you're not going to get a stuck fermentation because the alcohol ends up being so high or um, you end up being able to have natural, effortless, natural wines. And, and uh, it's, it's, I remember the first vintages of rain. Well, the first vintage was, you know, uh, all native ferments, all that. And I remember, cause I, I had come from other cellars and I have done tons of additions and, um, you know, you talked about Isinglass. That was my least favorite uh, finding agent that we did back in the day at Robert Mondavi. I couldn't stand it. Um, and I just remember being like, when you don't find a wine, the wines are so beautiful and pure and you do kind of alter the character of wines in fining. And um, so being liberated and not adding yeast, um, I remember not being able to sleep at night just because I was worried I was going to wake up to like a stuck fermentation or something because of all the fear I had behind like, oh my gosh, we're not going to pitch yeast or we're not going to. And um, now I would be heartbroken and devastated if somehow uh, someone pitched yeast into one of our tanks just because um, I don't think that it's because I don't like yeast and, and, and the idea of commercial yeast. I just think that there's something so much more special in the native yeast that comes from the vineyard, that microflora, that, that, that resin from the flowers, the grasses, the trees that stick to the grape that create the bloom. And so I'm just, we work our butts off in the vineyard and in farming. Why would you ever want to, you know, change things? And this is just my philosophy. I think we, we, we share a lot of this, um, as a group here, but, um, uh, I think that when you when you look at it, it's you know the great wines around the world. The wines that I really love um, are made in a natural way. The way Dan makes his wines, the way Jasmine makes her wines, and and Brandon, you know the way you make your wines, and Vince, the way you, the wines you love. And uh, so, yeah, I got the work harvest. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I'd love to add something to that beautiful Please. statement that you just shared, Carla, which is, you know, we at Hirsch, our entire focus is on making wines that express the vineyard. And I think wines can be bio indicators of the health of your soil, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a stuck fermentation, 
you know, because there's not enough nutrients, you know, coming in with the grapes from the vineyard, then, you know, maybe, maybe we need to be looking at our soils and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's, there's many, many examples of that. So anyways, if, if your interest, you know, for those of us like Carlo and I make Pinot Noir such a magical grape with such a profound ability to express the, the site. So if you have an interesting site, or maybe it's not interesting, but you're really curious about your site. You don't know if it's interesting yet. You want to make the wine in such a way that the site can shine. So you want to minimize additives, but you also want to be thinking about balance in the ripeness, right? You know, excessive ripeness is such a homogenizer. Um, you also want to be thinking about extraction. You know, if you're over extracting, you can really be effacing the character of the vineyard. So there's so many things um, beyond just the things that are emphasized in the natural wine movement that we think about when we're trying to make wines that really express our vineyard. Um, and if you really care about that, then you're going to be fairly minimalist in this kind of stuff um, so that the wines are evocative of your site, unique, you preserve that energy um, and you learn something about your site through the wines. Yeah, and, and just to also uh, tie into what Jasmine was saying, it's interesting because uh, I've done some talks and people will say, well, when you blind organic and conventional wines, you can't taste the difference or biodynamic organic. We, we did this one in Burgundy when I was at Dujac, Claude de la Roche, biodynamic versus organic, can we tell the difference? And well, that, that was really like cutting hairs. But when you look at it also, I think that when you go to like the, the uh, polling opposites, let's say biodynamics and conventional, what we don't take it, what we don't account for is how the wines are treated in the cellar. And so when you do native fermentations, when you pick all these different things, and like you said, um, the, the kind of uh, sugar levels and, and how that can be very much a, a uh, lead to a very powerful wine that overpowers a lot of the more delicate underlying notes. Um, so I don't think we've ever, there's ever been a fair shake on talking about um, truly conventional versus organic. And also the other thing is when, like at Claude de la Roche, when we were doing this, there, there was, you, you were talking about rows apart, right? <laughs> so if, if, if it was conventional, then the conventional would certainly affect the, the rows away. And this wasn't conventional, this was biodynamic versus organic. But so you need to have, it's a very tough study to really do. But I truly believe, uh, and echoing what Jasmine was saying, is that if you did apples to apples, that you would see so much more substance uh, when farmed at a high level and kind of a biodynamic um, uh, manner versus conventional. Um, and, and it is a study that's very hard to prove, right? But I, I think that it's uh, it, it makes total sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um Fascinating discussion. I feel like we could have we could have an, uh, a whole day of, of talks about this and, and, and still have more to talk about. But I did want to get to another topic, which is service and storage. And Vincent, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, quite a bit. But so you're a master sommelier. Um, what are sort of some general rules that you think that people should always stick to in terms of service? Uh well, speaking of storage, I'm in a I'm I'm in one of our wine cellars at the restaurant at 59 degrees, so um, that's a that's a great segue. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of storage, uh, you know, a cool a, a consistent temperature uh, is best. Uh, you know, be that if you you know if you don't have a wine cooler, um, you know, finding a, a closet with uh, you know my my. Uh, original wine cellar was the corner of a closet and still is, and uh, it stays at a, it's not against an outside wall and the, uh, the temperature, there aren't large swings um, and, you know, storing wines on their side because I don't have a, uh, a humid controlled uh, closet to put them in. Um, it's not necessarily a requirement, but it certainly helps to keep the corks, corks wet. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of service, I try to, you know, just have very, um, very, the, the only rule I have is that to just enjoy it, uh, you know, wherever you are. And if you're not doing that, then none of the rest of it matters. Um, and I try to think about service as more of guidelines because uh, it, it's going to depend a lot on context. You know, are you at a restaurant or are you at home? Or are you on vacation? Or are you on your honeymoon? Um, what tools do you have available to you? But uh, um, one of the main things is thinking about temperature. I think uh, by and large, as Americans, we drink uh, tasty, delicious things that uh, deserve to be served at a warmer temperature, uh, much too cold. So, you know, a good, a good kind of uh, base rule for that is uh, if you've had it in the fridge, take it out of the fridge for five or 10 minutes before you open it. If it's a white or a bubbles, just to let it warm up a touch. 
And if it's a red, you know, even consider putting it in the fridge for five to 10 minutes just to let it cool down a touch. Um, you know, especially uh, in Napa when we get up to 90 or 100 degrees. Um, it's easy to it's easy for the the ambient or natural temperature around us um, to to warm stuff up uh, really quickly. So it's nice to have a, a little bit of a chill. Um, if you if you have the time and ability to do so, I like to pull the cork in advance um, or unscrew the top, uh, you know, whatever whatever the closure is. Give it 15, 20 minutes just to breathe on its own. Um, I don't think decanting is required. Um, uh, but it, it, it can be nice either to remove off sediment or to, um, to warm up the wine a bit uh, if the red is really cold. Uh, we do that at the restaurant sometimes. If uh, you know a red comes out of a 59 degree cellar, it's nice to warm it up just a touch by decanting. Um, and if you, do, if you do have a good stemware, that's great. Uh, I prefer to just have standard Riedel Bordeaux glasses and all purpose glasses at home. Uh, and try not to make too much of a fuss of it. Um, I've been in situations uh, on the road where had to drink really, uh, you know, poor me, but had to drink really a delicious wine out of, uh, you know, the, the hotel plastic cups that they yeah. provide you with. And, um, but it was still delicious and amazing because of the context and the experience. So the only hard rule I have is, is to enjoy it and to make sure um, you're not putting too much, too much pressure and emphasis on it because uh, Wine's meant to be shared. It's meant to have fun. And uh, um, as long as that part is happening, the rest of it tends to not matter as much. But yeah, the, yeah. the service of it, what you serve it in, I think those are, those, are, those are good guidelines to abide by and everything else is more kind of cherry on top. And as a consumer in a restaurant, what are the best questions they could ask a sommelier to be sure they order a bottle that they're mm -hmm. going to enjoy? That's great. Um, that's that's a really good topic, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, tying in what Jasmine was saying earlier, um, it we I tend to ask a lot more questions and try to listen to what uh, a guest is saying. So I think it's a little bit of the a little bit of it, it, it's got to be a team effort, so to speak. Um, good questions to ask are ones that have uh, some parameters within them. Um, so specifying what you're comfortable with. And, and what you're looking for in the form of a question, I think is one of the, the quickest ways to get um, a list of possibilities from a sommelier or from your server. So saying, hi, you know, I want a Pinot Noir under $100 that I can't get uh, locally, or you know, giving, some, giving some sort of uh, uh, parameters within the question are extremely helpful because nothing is more, um, you know, uncomfortable, I think, for a guest when they there's a specific price point or parameters in mind yeah. that aren't being um, uh, that aren't being shared. And, and then to have recommendations come back that are far outside the parameters of what someone is comfortable with. And then that conversation just shuts down. So I that's if it's not explicitly stated. Um, I'll try to get there without asking directly because I think it's uh, uh, unless it's very, unless it's very clear that uh, that price is um, uh, um, not an option or it is a very sensitive topic. I try to avoid asking that question until until it's absolutely necessary. Um, yeah. And, and is it acceptable or not acceptable to send back a bottle of wine if you just don't like it? The short answer is yes, uh, but that's that's a deeper, more nuanced uh, conversation. Um, the short answer is yes, because who really wants to be held hostage to, you know, quite frankly, pay for and or consume a wine that they don't like? Um, I don't think that sounds like an enjoyable time for, for anybody, uh, myself included. But, you know, I, it, it's happened on... It, it happens occasionally, but uh, oops, sorry, we just uh, turned on music in here. I may have to. Uh, to... Um, one of the main things is uh, actually, Vanessa, if you don't mind coming back to me, uh, just in one minute. Active rest. Absolutely. I apologize. No problem, because I actually had a question for Dan that I wanted to ask before our time is up, which is which is about innovation. So when talking about the wine, the wine business, the wine industry, how innovative are we? 
Well, we just uh, we just learned about e-commerce in 2020 during a pandemic, so I wouldn't say we're that innovative. <laughs> Fair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, thanks to you guys at Wine Access. No, but the, the the beauty of of wine is that it's been basically made the same way for thousands of years, and we're not really trying to screw it up. We're just trying to you know accentuate a lot of things that we've all said earlier about you know where it's grown, how it's grown, um, how we want to kind of protect it, and then give it and then serve it at its best opportunity. So. Um, but naturally, you know, in, in essence, like wine is not, has not changed in how it's made. Um, and it hasn't really changed in how it's been packaged for a couple of hundred years in glass bottles under natural cork. So I, I think as an industry and, and then it hasn't really changed the ingredients labeling, ingredients label, labeling didn't happen because it came out of the, it came out of prohibition and all they cared about in prohibition was alcohol content and alcohol was the devil. So we needed to talk about alcohol. We needed to talk about uh, sulfites came later. Vintages weren't required, you know, so we're, we're still, you know, we're still a very kind of young industry uh, when it comes to innovation. Um, and I think that's what makes it so romantic and so nostalgic and so kind of heartfelt and it gives us the opportunity to connect with people because most of our best connections over uh, over a glass of wine are the things that we remember. And you throw innovation in there in a way that's gonna like just muddy the waters. I think that's, but yeah, I'm more romantic about it. We don't need to be that innovative. <laughs> Vincent, are you are you back without Shira, DJ in the yeah. background? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, pardon, the, pardon the, uh, the DJ interruption there. Um, <laughs> And so I think we were talking about sending uh, sending bottles sending back, a bottle back. and yes. you know it certainly is not uh, you know my uh, I never want to uh, intimidate a guest or to to have anyone ever feel intimidated in that circumstance when you just don't enjoy uh, a bottle. But it it that leads into more more questioning and more teamwork of you know why what is it about the wine that you know wasn't enjoyable and yeah it's a it's a hard pill to swallow especially if it's an expensive one but you know it's it, at the end of the day um so many other industries that if you don't like something it's you know it, it's it's taken care of or you you find a way to get around it so you know it, for me we're taking the wine off the table immediately we're removing all glasses returning to the conversation and, and um, you know, exploring a bit more. And um, it, it, it's somewhat related to, you know, if a wine is, uh, is, is, is off, whereas the sommelier or the, the server doesn't think it's off, you know, that's, that's a whole other thing. And, you know, if, if in fact the bottle seems sound, then going back to it and saying, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps looking for another wine um, of a different style within that same price point. Um, can't think of too many times off the, uh, you know, in 10 years that I've had a second bottle go back that they just didn't like. So it takes a, uh, um, sommeliers drink expensive wines that are sent back. Uh, not necessarily because, well, you know, I want to be at a restaurant that does that, but unfortunately we don't do that here. Um, it, you know, it is, uh, it, it's a business at the end of the day, uh, restaurants, um, especially through the last two years. Um, you know, we've taken a long, hard look uh, at the industry uh, for a variety of reasons, but, you know, that's something that, that definitely uh, hurts. But if it's, uh, you know, if it's something that is within reason, we'll either, um, you know, try and turn around and, and perhaps sell it by the glass to uh, to other guests or use it a part of elevating someone else's experience. Um, one of my favorite things to do at the restaurant, uh, if we have leftover wine or um, something gets sent back, uh, is to do a is to do a class with the kitchen. Um, that's something we've been doing on Saturday nights for a long time, and looping that team more into uh, into the education uh, because I think I think it's important to include everyone and not just the servers and captains or just the psalms. Um, yeah, but that's a, that's a tough one, but I encourage, um, uh, both on the consumer and the professional side to, to make sure that conversation leading up to the choice of bottle, you know, is, um, is, you know, you feel like you've collaborated and you feel like you've both, both, um, come to a good decision. 
if the guest decided that bottle on their own without any sort of interaction or assistance from someone, then then that almost resets the conversation of, okay, hey, what are you into? What would you like? What are things that you value uh, in the wine that you would like to enjoy? And and going from there, that's uh, yeah, it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky situation when that happens. But you know, at the end of the day, when you you have to think about the bigger picture and you know the whole month and the quarter and the year and in the span of that, is it um, how much of an impact is it really going to make if you go home and sleep on it and come back the next day? And um, 99.9 percent .9 of the time, it's it's not a big deal. I have. Yeah been a part of one or one or two services where some really in high-end wine got sent back and it's uh it's tough it's challenging so yeah yeah um we are getting close to the end of our of our panel here so i did want to say for anyone who's been posting questions either in the q a uh or the chat who does not get them answered during these last couple minutes feel free to engage with wine access at wine access uh, on Instagram. And we'll be happy to continue this conversation there for anything we can't cover. But in these last couple of minutes, actually Vincent, just to keep you uh, on the spot here, um, as chairman of the diversity committee uh, for the court of master sommeliers, what types of things are you doing? What, what do, are we doing well as a wine industry and what do we still have lots of room to improve upon? Uh, well, since you just said it, uh, to be frank, um, uh, you know, the last uh, two years have exposed what uh, many people already knew or really brought to the forefront, but we have, a, we have an accessibility problem uh, in the industry. And, you know, some of that stems from communication, some of that stems from uh, awareness, and, and, you know, I think all, a lot of it stems from is just, just the sheer effort of uh, leaders in the wine industry to, to make to, to bring everyone else up uh, around them. And that was a big, uh, a big reason for me wanting to pursue the certification that I did so that I could then turn around and, and help bring people, um, bring people into it. Um, you know, I think we, we, we do a very good job at surviving as an industry. Uh, we've done so for quite some time, um, bringing people together uh, as we are here on this panel and as we do every day here at the restaurant and um, we do at home, uh, et cetera, but, you know, providing more, more access um, that also ties in financially, uh, especially living in Napa Valley. Um, the challenges we face as an agricultural community, but also as a, you know, world-renowned uh, wine destination comes at a cost. And there's not a lot of wine being produced in the Valley that's really accessible for people that are perhaps, uh, you know, a wine novice that's really just getting started in the industry and wants to learn about Napa, there is absolutely a, um, there's a price floor that is really hard to um, go lower than if you want to remain a, a viable business in the Napa Valley. Um, and, and, and that's shown, I think the most recent report is that um, this was the first year where wine consumption in the U.S. Uh, declined, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or perhaps that's what the, just the younger generation, but it's the first time in a long time, um, but also bringing in more younger, more diverse uh, consumers into the industry, because if we don't have that, then uh, if that continues to decline, then we don't have uh, an industry anymore. Um, sustainability in general, we've talked about it a lot uh, on this panel, but not only communicating that, but if we don't find ways to be more sustainable, then this this won't this won't go on. We won't you know we won't be here. This industry won't be here for much longer. Um, and then I think specifically in the United States, something that we could do so much better that that Europe does much better uh, than us is just being more informed at a younger age and responsible at a younger age surrounding not just wine but but alcohol in general and our relationship with it. Um, most sommeliers or, you know, winemakers or uh, viticulturists or anyone in the industry, I think a lot of us can say, unless we grew up in it, that it, it happens more by accident or you kind of mm -hmm. fall into it, especially yeah. for psalms. It's, you know, you're a server or, or maybe a food runner and you're like, oh, you know, what are you doing? Why is that, you know, why do you get to smell and taste wine and sell wine and serve it? And it's more of a curiosity and I know that was the case for me and several other colleagues, but it, it was never something I grew up thinking that I would do as a career. How we change all those things, uh, that's a much broader conversation, but I think those are some well, things we can be better. 
Absolutely. And and thank you for, for the work you're doing on that committee. And as we are at time, I did want to say thank you so much to this uh, amazing panel. Thank you for your honesty, your candor, for sharing your thoughts, opinions, and knowledge um, with all of us here. Thank you for everyone at home that tuned in. I did see some questions. Will this Was this recorded? Yes. Uh, Decanter and Wine Access will be sending this out on social channels and for Wine Access through email. Um, again, I wanted to thank Decanter, and if you're interested in learning more about the Wine Access and Decanter Wine Club, you can find that um, on wineaccess.com forward slash decanter. So thank you. I hope everyone had a great time. I know I learned a ton, and we will be doing more of these in the future, so please stay tuned. Thank you all so much. <laughs>